straight talk from Israel. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. Welcome to the Science of Kabbalah with your host, Rabbi Yitzhak Michelson and William Hall here on Israel News Talk Radio. Welcome to the Science of Kabbalah here on Israel News Talk Radio. I'm William Hall and I'm here with my awesome, amazing, wonderful friend, Rav Yitzhak Michelson. That's me. I tried to give you that theatric voice, Yitzhak <laughs> Michelson. Uh, so... This week, I'm really, I'm really anticipating this one quite much because this is has always been one of my favorite parts of discussing Bereshit, you know, and something we didn't talk about previously. But I'm thinking you probably won't have time to discuss it because we never do, we never have enough time to get everything in. But mm-hmm. in the last probably a couple of years ago, uh, the latest thing that came up as something that seemed to be very important was the translation of the very first verse, you know, in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth, mm-hmm. and this it should be should have been translated in the beginning of God's creating the heavens and the earth. Right. So it'd be kind of nice to talk about that a little bit if we have time, just okay. to kind of why is it so important to understand it the, a, a different way, and is it even correct? Yeah, no problem. We can probably do that. You know, we come in in the first segment, kind of spend a little bit of time on that. Sure. Originally, when I was thinking about the show. Even though we're coming up to a new parsha, we'll be in Parshat Noach. I, I didn't want to miss Breshit. Of course, we were on break because the Chagim kept coming in when we do our show and when our show airs. It, it kept coming out on Chag, so it, right. it was kind of hard to do it. Um, but I do want to. I do originally. I thought to myself, well, maybe we'll just talk about Breshit and kind of I'll talk to you and see if you have any questions and see if there, I can answer them and just kind of have a back and forth. I certainly don't want to take away from what the plan already is, because from our conversation <laughs> earlier, I don't want to miss any of that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so no. just comment on mine last if we have time. All right, no problem. <laughs> no, no, I'm going to start on yours, because uh, it, it, it's kind of an interesting subject, and it, it's kind of an important thing to touch on, because I think I I know one of the concerns that you have uh, okay. about <laughs> the importance of that verse and how it's been translated and misinterpreted as well by a certain sector of people. But but I do want to talk about more about the creation of man and the whole use of sort of poetic use of language and, and the fact that we see words that are often used and, and somehow that the different words in Hebrew can have different meanings and different translations and and we're going to talk about that as it relates to the idea of being naked. So you want to stay with us for this one. We're going to be back here on the Science of Kabbalah after a short break. So stay with us. The return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel was prophesied in the Bible thousands of years ago and is coming true today. Shalom. Join me, Josh Wander, on Israel Unplugged. Listen in as we delve into the spiritual and physical aspects of the Jewish return to Zion. We'll discuss the biblically mandated, historic, and of course practical understandings of this incredible transition from exile to redemption. That's Israel Unplugged, every Monday on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. Welcome back to Science of Kabbalah with Rabbi Yitzhak Michelson and William Hall here on Israel News Talk Radio. Welcome back, everyone, to the Science of Kabbalah here on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. This is Rav Yitzchak, and uh, I'm here with my good friend William Hall. And we were talking about getting into Breshid a little bit, and you asked a question and asked you to sort of cover this a little bit. So it's interesting. I was talking to my wife about this uh, over Shabbat and the idea that when we read the first verse in the very beginning of Genesis, it says, Breshid bar Elohim et t'shemayim v'etaretz. Typically, it's translated in the beginning. But there really is an issue with that because when you look at that word, Breshit, it's a compound word. It's, there, is, there is no such word, Breshit. It's the letter Bet, Reshit. Bet is the preposition for the word in. So, and Reshit means beginning. If you look in the scripture, there's no other place that you're going to see a bet at the beginning of the word reshit. You know, you see places like reshit chachma, 
the beginning of, you know, in that verse, the beginning of wisdom. Automatically, a lot of the commentators ask the question, like, why does the Bible even start? Why was why does the Torah even start with the letter Bet? Why doesn't it start with the letter Aleph, for instance, which is the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet? Why does it start with a Bet? So there, there are different interpretations. And, and interestingly enough, on our show, we always talk about the idea of physic- physicality and spirituality. We talk about the, f- the idea of duality um, that we have both of these sides. We often talk about the idea that we have two inclinations, that we have a yetzer hara and a yetzer tov, a good inclination and an evil inclination. A- another interpretation of that bet is that there is both olam hazeh, this world, and the olam haba, the world to come. So there are all these different interpretations, but Rashi brings a very interesting interpretation of Bereshit. He says that it it literally is saying in beginning. In beginning of what? In beginning of creating. In beginning of creating what? So he argues that this is actually in the very beginning, Hashem solidifying the promise of having a relationship with a chosen nation, the people of Israel, and giving him, giving them the land, giving them the Torah. That in that very first verse, we have Hashem solidifying the covenant that He will eventually make with this peop- with this people. That when it says in beginning, that that beginning is talking about the beginning of creating the this nation, the beginning of creating the nation of Israel and having a covenant with them. I know that this verse became very famous because you know people say when it says. You know, Breshit Bar Elohim, Et HaShemayim Ve'et it's that Et, Aleph Tav, being the first letter of the, the Hebrew alphabet and the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, that the Christians tried to take this and, and say that because Et has no interpretation and it, because it's the beginning of the end, that they try to connect this somehow to their failed Messiah. And the truth of the matter is that when we're talking about linguistics, this idea of the bet not fitting in, when you use the, the, the word et, et is a identifier um, in the Hebrew language to identify the subject of a verse, meaning that when there is a, a verb, that something is taking place. And so in this specific verse, we're saying that the verb is bara, this idea of creation, that if you didn't have the et there, et ha-shemayim ve-et ha-aretz, then you could mistranslate from a linguistic standpoint and say that, I mean, God forbid, chas shalom that we should say that the heavens and the earth were the ones that created something. So you see, the, the whole idea of having this et ha-shemayim ve-et ha-aretz is that it's identifying that a verb took place, bara creation, and that creation took place by Hashem, and it was through Hashem that this creation of the heavens and the earth came into being. That's that's sort of in a nutshell. I mean, we could spend hours and hours, days and days, months and months, just on the first verse of uh, Breshit as it relates to creation, and we've talked about this on the show, the whole idea of uh, you know, how creation came about, why creation came about, the idea of Hashem's mercy and Hashem's compassion. I think I heard uh, one of the one of the discussions on that was um, the, how, how old, the earth, excuse me, how old the earth is, mm-hmm. you know, as far as uh, is it really only, you know, 6,000 years old or is it 60 million years old? And this if it's if it's that old then maybe science is right in the beginning of God's creating not in the beginning, this is what he did, but in the beginning of his creating, this was along with it, so to speak. And I think that was something that was trying to mix uh, mix up, not mix them up, but uh, join the two, science and religion together, so well, to speak. You could also, and, and the argument comes in too, that in the beginning of creating, it could be talking about in the beginning of creating this particular world, this particular universe. Right. Yes, perfect. Right. Because there are also interpretations that this is not the first world that, Hashem created, that there were many worlds that he created and destroyed until, and, and here was this chaos, this tohu vavohu that it talks about in, in Genesis, this, you know, void and chaos, and that, and that he brought this, you know, out of this, you know, this void and chaos into structure, 
and and created this world and created this universe. So that's another whole argument that we could go into about this. But but, but I, I did want to go into and talk about that idea that I was talking about related to the creation of man. And and I was thinking about it this morning as I was doing Berkot Shachar, the, the morning blessings. And, you know, you know, putting on tefillin in the morning and doing these blessings. One of the blessings that we see is um, we say, Baruch atah Hashem, Elokeinu Melech Olam, Malbish, uh, Malbish Arumim. Blessed are you, you know, Lord our God, King of the universe, who clothes the naked, Arumim. Um, and so that's part of, you know, we have these 18 different morning blessings that are said each day and... Um, you know, when we get up in the morning and we, we wash our hands and we get into this, this, you know, this prayer mode. And then what do we do? Uh, the very next thing we do is we start putting on clothing. We start getting dressed. And, you know, if you're an Orthodox Jewish male, then, you know, part of that dress is putting on a tali katan, you know, wearing tzitzit. Um, and it also, you know, as part of the davening, as part of the morning prayer, you put on a talit, you know, uh, a talit gadol you know, bigger talit, and you put on tefillin. This is all part of being dressed. Um, You know, we could talk about this from both a spiritual and physical standpoint, because you could also say that in the physical, we're putting on all of these outward things, um, our clothing, our talit katan, our talit gadol, our tefillin, and it's our prayers it's these prayers that whether you're Jewish or not Jewish, in, in whatever way you express yourself, that through thought and through speech, we also dress ourselves spiritually. And, and, and you could say that it's through the, the Torah, it's through the mitzvot that we perform to Hashem that we are putting on garments for our soul, so to speak. So that each day what we're doing is we're both clothing ourselves, both in physical garments, but also in divine garments, because hopefully what we're doing is in preparing ourselves in the morning, in whatever way you do that, through organized prayer like I'm talking about, in a structured way, or in whatever way you approach Hashem, that we we are putting on garments to affect our thinking to affect our speaking and to affect the way in which we act. And one of the things that we've talked about on this show is the idea that, for instance, in Judaism, it's taught in the Zohar and in other places, that when we sleep, the soul and its garments depart and they leave the body. And then um, we're sort of left in this state, you could say, of nakedness, of uh, spiritual nakedness when we sleep. And then it's through arising in the morning. Thank God Hashem, you know, gives us um, physicality and allows us to, he returns the neshama to us. He returns that soul to us. And and then what we do is we once again clothe ourselves. And and part of that, that uh, tikkun, that rectification that we go through now is, is coming into this time of prayer and the blessing um, and that blessing that I'm talking about, this idea of you clothe the naked, is the ability that not only do we have the ability to clothe ourselves, that Hashem clothes the naked, but He gives us this ability through this relationship with Him, um, that He blesses us with this desire to be clothed again spiritually as well as physically. And and so on a, on a much deeper level, this state of nakedness sort of re- represents a lack of uh, a purpose, a lack of purpose that we have. And so this for me is where the creation story comes in, specifically the creation of man, the creation of Adam and Chava and the whole story of the garden of Gan Eden and the idea of the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and how that relates to this word arum, arom, arumim, which we see over and over again in this story, 
related to Adam and Chava, related to the Nachash, to the snake or the serpent, um, because it says that he's Arum, and then right after it talks about him being Arum, it doesn't say he's naked, it says he's cunning, or more cunning than all the beasts um, of all those that were created. And then when it starts talking about Adam and Chava, it says they were Arumim, they were naked. And at one point they were naked and it didn't bother them. And then further on in the story, they were naked and it did bother them. So that's, we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but we have to go to a break. So stay with us. We'll be back shortly here on the Science of Kabbalah on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. Hi, I'm Steve Miller. And I'm Matt Zucker. Join us for Lighten Up, where we take a look at the week's current events in Israel and from around the Jewish world through a humorous lens. If you've been paying attention during these crazy times, you know that it's a challenge to parody life anymore. But join Steve and I as we give it the old college try. Not only is being happy an obligation, but life is just too short to take it all so seriously. So join me, Steve Miller, and me, Matt Zucker, for a Lighten Up every Monday morning at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 5 p.m. Israel, only on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. Welcome back to Science of Kabbalah with Rabbi Yitzchak Michelson and William Hall here on Israel News Talk Radio. Welcome back to Science of Kabbalah and Israel News Talk Radio, part two, I believe. Actually, yes. technically, it's three. Anyway, point being, you were talking earlier about um, how they were clothed, and at one point, uh, it was it mentioned it in the single form, and then it mentioned it like in this plural form, right? Or did that misunderstand something earlier? Oh, you mean in talk? No, well, I'm I'm talking about the difference in the word, the word arum being singular, and then arumim. Arum related to to the snake and Arumim related to Adam and Chava. Gotcha, gotcha. So, um, just so if it was plural versus singular, as far as the, I see what you mean. So it was referring to the snake, but it wasn't talking about it being naked as him being cunning. Right. So, okay, gotcha. That makes sense. Yeah. Because you know we talked earlier about how the concept of uh, there's one view how uh, in the midrash uh, somewhere where they perceive. Adam, uh, Adam and Hava were were already one being that they were back to back. Yes, and so it's maybe a bit singular that way, but it's referring to the snake. That would make sense. It's also true what you're talking about in the idea of the midrash, which is really brings home this idea of the connection that they had. In other words, it says that they were back to back, that they were formed back to back, so that they, in a way, Adam could see all of creation. He could see all the animals that had been created and all of them were brought before him and he was asked to name them, but there was not a mate for him. It wasn't until they were separated that Hashem sort of separated them and they were face to face that things changed. And so first, let's sort of talk about how this whole idea of the creation came about. So we know that Adam was the first human in existence. We know that Hashem created him on the sixth day of creation, according to the Torah. And it says that he was created in the image of Hashem. And it also, we know that in our sources, it says that his wisdom is said to have surpassed that of even the Malachim, of the angels in heaven. And there are different opinions as to how he was created, there's one opinion that he's created that Hashem moistened the earth with mist and then he formed a body from the dust and he, he breathed life in, into the nostrils. And we know that for sure because it says Nishmat Rahim that Hashem breathed the breath of life and he became a living soul. And then Hashem placed Adam in the garden, we know, and, and sort of like this utopian place with luxurious trees and bearing luxurious fruit. And I, and I think that, <laughs> that sometimes the focus is put too much on that. The focus is, is put too much on this idea of the fruit. In other words, uh, for years and years and years, people have been trying to figure out, well, what kind of fruit was it that they ate? Was it an apple? I, was it? Let me insert a yeah, question. Sure. So the idea of... Adam and Eve, my, my understanding, of course, of Adam in the beginning, when God did create him, 
mm-hmm. that he had he he was created in the image of Hashem, which is correct. Uh, and we we know that Hashem has both masculine and feminine qualities. Yes. And Adam also was the only human being that ever lived that had both as well until right. you know Hashem separated them. Right. So I can see how Adam for sure would be above the angels. I mean, is it is it true that angels are they don't have a sex? They're just like messengers. They don't, they're, they're not male or female, right? Right. That's true. So that brings up my question. So I can't remember where it's at in the, in the Tanakh uh, in the Torah, I believe. Uh, yeah, it actually is in the Torah. In fact, that's maybe even be in Genesis now that I think about it, uh, where it says the, uh, the the sons of God came down to the to, to the daughters of men. And on interpretation, one of the interpretations is that the sons of God were t- referring to the angels. Right. And if they don't have sex and ha- have, have a sexual you know side, male or female, then what would they, what were they doing with the daughters of men? And they created these, you know, these men of renown. Right. Um, I'm not sure I understand that. Okay. So the this becomes an issue of linguistics again. And this is where people get in trouble. And that's why it's interesting that we're having this discussion about the way in which words are interpreted, especially Hebrew words, and the fact that Hebrew words can have several different meanings. So for instance, the word, I'm going to say the word Elohim, because when I say Elohim now, I'm not talking about Elohim. I'm not talking about God. There are times that we see that word Elohim being referred to individuals. It even refers to Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, as I'm going to send him as Elohim to you. Okay? Meaning that there's a level of authority that Moshe Rabbeinu is going to have that's above those of anybody else on the earth because he had a special relationship with Hashem. Okay. When we're talking about these, these people... This Elohim, Elohim, as it relates to man, can mean strong ones. It does not have to mean gods, okay? It doesn't, it doesn't reflect um, specifically on somebody having some kind of divine persona um, if they're called Elohim. So in, the, in that verse that you're talking about, it might have been a group of people that were of renown. They they might have been like similar to like the, when the Meraglim, when the when the uh, the spies went into the land and they saw these people and thought they were giants. Okay, they were different types of human beings at the time, all throughout the beginning of creation. And so the idea is that these Elohim that we're talking about do not have to be Malachim, and in fact they're not Malachim. Um, it just means strong ones in that context. And they were just probably human beings that were at a different level physically, you know, um, than the rest of the people. At least that's my interpretation. I'm sorry. Does the Hebrew not say the sons of God? No, it says it says the sons. If I'm remembering correctly, it says the sons of Elohim. Oh, okay, okay. So it doesn't necessarily mean, that, like you're saying, that sons of strong ones, sons of, of the strong ones. It can mean it doesn't gotcha. have to mean sons of God. That's what I'm saying. Elohim in that situation, people always assume that because it says Elohim there, that it's referring to God or gods. Okay, because Elohim is plural. Okay, but okay, the, so, si- the so same good. way, the same way Moses is said to be called Elohim to the people. Moses is not God. Moses is not divine. When Hashem says, I'm going to send you as an Elohim to the people. I'm going to send you as a strong one. I'm going to send you with my authority. He was going with with a level of authority, you know, as a strong person above those of other people in the world. So, Okay, so how about now the Midrash that that talks about how um, Hashem gave the angels an opportunity to come down and to prove themselves worthy of the Torah or to, to do the Torah or whatever. And they corrupted themselves. There's even uh, extra, you know, I would call them extra ancient text uh, that would, that would say they they even had certain names. One of them taught the women how to put, how to be beautify themselves with makeup and all right. this other stuff they became corrupt. Yeah. You have to be very careful with Midrashim because um, like anything else, we can't take specific little snippets of a midrash, and take it literal, and 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 take anything literally. It's the same thing when people try to take the Zohar and Kabbalah and try and literalize it and gotcha. make it literal. Um, it's the same thing with Torah. Torah, what we're talking about in this situation, 
um, ultimately, what's the final message we're meant to learn from from our studies? Is it are, are we studying all of these things to be just intelligent human beings that have a higher level of wisdom and we can say, oh, I know how to speak Hebrew, I know how to understand this word, or I, I, if we're not, if what we're learning is not putting in a, putting us in a position to come closer to Hashem, to increase our level of dvekut, this idea of cleaving to Hashem and being connected to Hashem, then everything is a waste for, for me. And, and it should be a waste for anybody. So I'm not saying that the Midrashim don't say some of these things, but it's the same thing like when I study the Talmud. If I study the Talmud, there are times that the Talmud talks about very sort of sort of otherworldly, sort of crazy situations. Um, but you have to look at it in the full context. What of, why are the rabbis bringing such stories? Why are they bringing such extreme things to the table? And at the end of the day, it's all meant um, to be contextualized within the greater story and to bring us to an understanding of what the halakha is, what the Jewish law is, how we're supposed to act, how we're supposed to interact with each other, how we're supposed to interact with Hashem. So I'm happy to, off the air, look at that particular midrash with you. Sure. And, and, and you know, and, and kind of come to some kind of answer that will help you. But, you know, since no we're we're almost at the end of part two and uh, <laughs> and uh, and we haven't even really gotten into the crux of where I wanted to go. I'm going to maybe we can maybe next week we can actually continue where we left off. All right. No problem. Just remind me about that. You know, OK, um, you know, so that I don't so they won't lose that if you want to talk about that further. So. So just to kind of put us back in what I was saying, I was talking about this idea that uh, that everybody focuses sort of on the wrong thing um, because there's no question that it was kind of this utopian place, Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden, and there were like these luxurious trees and all kinds of luscious fruits and so forth. Um, but I think that people focus too much on what type of tree it was, what type of fruit it was. Like I said, you know, was it an apple? Was it a pomegranate? Was it a fig? Um, again, back to what I was saying, how does that help us? If I know that it's an apple or if I knew it was a pomegranate or if I knew it was a fig, what does that do for me? It doesn't change anything. It doesn't change my relationship with Hashem, knowing what kind of fruit it was. And it wasn't magical. It wasn't that this was some sort of magical fruit. I think what we have to focus on is what took place both before, like what was available to Adam and Chava before they ate from this tree and what was available to them after they ate from this tree. And so we're going to have to go to a break and hopefully uh, we can kind of at least try and get a, a little bit of understanding about this or at least my understanding from it. So stick with us. We're going to be right back here after a short break on the Science of Kabbalah. Are you tired of political correctness and the fear that you might offend someone? I'm not afraid to offend you. Wow, look who's talking tough. One has to be tough to keep sane today. Hi, I'm Alan Skorsky. And I'm Bela Seabrow. And join us every Wednesday for The Definitive Wrap as we interview the most sought-after guests and expose progressive trends that masquerade as enlightenment but actually destroy our freedoms. We are the No Wolf Zone, so buckle up for this exciting show. Buckling up, but I'm driving. <laughs> sure, you can drive, but I'm the navigator. Tune in for the No Nonsense, the definitive rap show, every Wednesday on Israel News Talk Radio. Welcome back to Science of Kabbalah with Rabbi Yitzchak Michelson and William Hall here on Israel News Talk Radio. Welcome back to our final segment of Science of Kabbalah here on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. So as I mentioned earlier, I knew that uh, if I derailed you, this was, <laughs> it was going to be a big derail. I think we maybe have talked about 10% 
of what we were going right. to today. So, yes, next week, let's definitely, if you don't mind, let's revisit this because this is this is truly one of my favorite areas of Tanakh. So, I'm enjoying the learning from you on this. Thing. So, I'll see if I can just listen for the rest of it. You don't you don't have to do that. But but remember, I said that originally my thought was to maybe just have a discussion about this, sure, and see if I could answer some of those questions. So, so I'm not against that. I think we can handle the main point that I wanted to get to in this last segment. I don't I don't think we really have to, like, you know, beat the horse. I, I'm just going to kind of throw it out there. So because I ended with the idea of saying that we sort of had a focus rather than on what kind of fruit it was or the, the tree. Uh, you had asked a question or, you know, before we even got on air today about actually the tree. The fact that it talks about a tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There are some opinions by our sages that it was actually one tree. There was a tree in the center of the garden and it was both a tree of life and a tree of the knowledge of good and evil because Hashem says, when you eat of that tree, you shall surely die. And it wasn't the idea that they would die, but that death would be introduced into the world. So so there is the opinion that they are the one and the same tree. And then there are opinions that they were, they were two separate trees. If they were two separate trees, how do you explain them? Which one is which? What What is what? Uh, so the, the more important one is the one that they were told not to eat from. Why am I saying it's more important? Because I said we have to determine or what I said the focus should be on was what was available to them before they ate from that tree and what was available to them after. What do I mean by what was available to them? From my perspective, if you look at it, we know in talking about the creation of the world and creation of the animals, even talking about the angels, the malachim, we know that no entity had free choice or free will. Hashem did not create animals with free will. The animals are given a nefesh, for instance, but not an ashama. They have a lower soul, an animalistic soul. My dog needs to eat. My dog needs to sleep, things like that. But my dog doesn't have free choice. He does what he's supposed to do as, as an animal. All of creation was doing what they were supposed to do. We could argue that before Adam and Chava ate from the tree, that they also did not have free choice or free will, even though we say that creation was created, that man was given free will. What I'm saying is there wasn't an awareness to them that they had free will or choice until they ate. I would argue that up until the eating of the fruit of that tree, that the only entity in the universe that had choice was Hashem. So the reason I bring that up is because we go into this whole idea, to me, about a story of choices. Because at the end of the day, when you talk about this word arum, when you talk about this idea of the nachash being arum, uh, it's translated all the time that this snake was more cunning than all the other animals that were created. But a room can can have other kind of meanings to it as well. It can it can have the idea of being prudent is one of the translations. If you look at other places in in the Tanakh, it says that it uses the word prudent to describe a room. So that when we're looking at this idea of a room, in one case being uh, being I'm sorry being prudent or being cunning, and then a man is then described as arumim, as being naked. What are we, why is it like that? We see that many times in, in the Tanakh, that there's this sort of poetic use of language like that, where words that look similar or have similar roots are used together to make a point. And, and so I would say that when we look at this idea of Arum, related to the Nachash, for instance, related to the snake. One of the things that it can be translated is the idea of smooth. And I don't even mean smooth from, uh, uh, because he was smooth, you could say, in the way he uh, manipulated things um, in order to get the woman to eat. But talking about smooth, the idea that um, like wasn't covered with hair or, or quills or spines or, or anything. And we know that snakes are smooth. Um, but I want to I want to bring up that I'm, I'm talking both in a physical sense and in a spiritual sense, meaning that in this story, I believe that there is both the physicality of the snake, the Nachash, 
And there was also the spirituality of the Nachash, and that we have to understand that both were at play in this situation. So we have this idea that we have this word arum, which is cunning or prudent in one situation, and then naked in another situation. So, so what happens? You could say that in a way, in saying that Adam and Chava didn't have choice or didn't understand that choice was available to them, there could be an argument that from all these different roots, arum, arom, um, all of these words related to this and everything that I'm talking about, that the Nachash, what he did was he claimed to be um, an entity without a veil, without sort of a mental veil, and and was capable to help others to remove the veil from their mind. And, and this is what I see going on in this situation. And so in this way, the Nachash, whether it was a snake, a physical snake, a serpent, whatever he looked like, represented himself to Chava, claiming to be somebody who could reveal to her and, and remove the veil from her closed eyes. Why do I say closed eyes? Because it says then their eyes were opened. Afterwards, once they they ate, their eyes were op- opened, and what did they see? They saw their nakedness. They saw their arumin. They saw the fact that they were naked. Now, if we go back to that idea of um, the midrash talking about them being back to back, being a single entity, okay, we could say that they were not separated. There was no differentiation between them. And if we go back to saying that Hashem was the only entity that had choice, knowing that they were back to back and knowing that, according to Kabbalah, they were completely spiritual beings. Remember, when they saw their nakedness, what happened? It says they put on fig leaves. They put on fig leaves. And even after they put on fig leaves, it said that they were naked. Okay, what do you mean they were naked? They already put on fig leaves. But even though they put on fig leaves, what did Hashem do for them? It said Hashem made them skins. Okay, we could argue that the skin there was literal skin because previous to that, they were they were totally beings of light. They were total spiritual beings that didn't have sort of flesh and blood the way we have it now. That only took place. That physicality only took place after they had an awareness. And so that's why I think that word is so interesting, that Aum, this idea of this prudent or wisdom or cunning um, was really an awareness that came into creation, specifically creation of Adam and Chava, the awareness came into them of choice. And, And why do I think that that's so weighty? Because if we think about ourselves, if we think about our own lives, probably the biggest burden we have in our lives, especially those of us that sort of want to connect to the Torah, those of us that want to connect to Hashem. And the biggest weight and burden for us is the fact that we have choice, is the fact that we have an evil inclination and we have a a good inclination and we're constantly faced with choices. I think that the embarrassment that took place, the idea of shame that took place from for Adam and Chava was the idea that once they ate from the tree, they, they were told not to eat from, and that's interesting because, like I, I told you off the air, it was called Eitz Da'at V'tov Ra before they ate from the tree. It was called the, the, the tree of knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil before they ate from it. After they ate from it, it had a much longer name. You know what the name was after they ate from it? Mm. The tree, <laughs> did you eat from the tree uh, that I told you not to eat from? It was oh, yeah. no longer called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So I'm saying what I see in this whole thing is that the weight that came upon them, the burden that came upon them, the embarrassment and the shame that they felt was now having this awareness that choice had entered the world. Beforehand, I think they had no understanding that they had choice. Now they had choice and the awareness came in that not only do we have choice, but we made the wrong choice. And I, and, I, and I don't necessarily, you and I talked about this and we might have to, you know, 
touch on this more a little bit next week if you want to keep going into this, is the idea of whether or not this was really sin. Um, you know, people want to say they sinned. I, I don't see any of those things as necessary. Some people want to call them punishments. I don't, I don't call them punishments. I That's think awesome. they were consequences to the choices that they made, not necessarily punishments, because you could say that it says that, well, your your pain will be increased in childbirth. It doesn't say you aren't going to have pain in childbirth. It just say it was increased. So I'm not so sure. I think we, we would have to go into this a little bit more. So yeah. anyway, um, you know, that's really, in a nutshell, where I wanted to go. I think really the focus has to be on Breshit, on this connection of these words and the translation and the interpretation of these words being focused more on the idea that choice entered the, the world. We have that same choice today and we have that same burden. And the same thing that embarrassed them and causes them shame is the same thing that causes us to be embarrassed and us to be ashamed before Hashem is the fact that we have this weight and burden of choices that we make and the consequences of the choices that we make as well. So anyway, as usual, <laughs> that's, that's it for today. That's a wrap. That's a wrap. So thank you, William, as always, for being with me. And thank you, everybody, for staying with us each week here on The Science of Kabbalah. Shalom. If you love Israel News Talk Radio, then you'll love our Facebook page. We keep you up to date on what's happening in Israel, plus little surprise treasures that we don't share on the radio. Go now to follow us on Facebook. Just look for the Israel News Talk Radio Facebook page and don't forget to subscribe and follow us by clicking on the like button. We post great stuff there that you'll want to share. Israel News Talk Radio on Facebook and Israel News Radio on Twitter. If you're hearing this message, everyone else can too. Advertise with Israel News Talk Radio and get your message out to people. We'll build a personalized package for you. Contact advertising at IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. Straight talk from Israel. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. Hey, this is Jake in Anchorage, Alaska, and I love listening to all the super interesting interviews and up-to-date information on what's happening in Israel. Hello, this is Anna King, originally from London, now living in Israel. And what can I say? Israel News Talk Radio is my cup of tea. My name is Bhaskar. I'm from India, and I love listening because you get to know the truth and wonderful voices from this lovely country. Mom! Okay, wait a minute. Hi, this is Chava Dax, and I'm calling for the rolling hills of Malaya Dumim, just north of Jerusalem. I always listen to Israel News Talk Radio to get all the latest news and commentary and to keep me up to date every day. This is Sarah Dax from Malaya Dumim, and I'm 12. I wish Israel News Talk Radio was boring so my mom wouldn't listen to it all the time. Mom! You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. News, opinion, and more. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio.